thank you everyone for joining us on what is this first um, event in a series of uh, issues to do with constitutional law matters, which is a project that's been set up by myself and Mark Elliott. Um, I'm Alison Young, I'm a professor of public law at the University of Cambridge, and it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you here to the event today. This is the first event in a series of seminars um, hosted by Constitutional Law Matters. And today we're going to be looking at who's in charge of the Westminster Parliament. We want these seminars to be interactive. So if you look on your Zoom screen, you will have a Q&A button. So if you do want to pose questions for the panelists, please do use that button and I'll be able to pose your questions to the panelists later on. What I'm going to do is introduce to you first each of the panelists and they're going to say very briefly a few words about their video or uh, the themes that they're going to be talking about this evening. And our first panelist this evening is Professor Mark Elliott. Uh, Mark is a Professor of Public Law here at Cambridge. He's also Chair of the Law Faculty and a Fellow of St Catherine's College. He's a former legal advisor to the House of Lords Select Committee on the Constitution and runs a very popular website, Public Law for Everyone. And it's my great um, honour to have him as my co-lead on this project. So we've been enjoying working together, which has been fantastic. So, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Alison. Um, so the, the, the aspect of the topic that I've been thinking about and that my video relates to is parliamentary sovereignty. Um, and that's important, I think, to our question tonight, who's in charge of the Westminster Parliament, because whatever we decide, the answer to that question might be, and I think that, that Meg and David are going to explore different aspects of this, whatever we decide, the answer to that question might be. Um, it's an important question to answer, because whoever is in charge of the Westminster Parliament, at least as a matter of, of, of legal theory, effectively has absolute power, because the fact that Parliament is sovereign means that there are no legal limits to the legislation that Parliament can enact. And there's a famous uh, saying, which is that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so this idea that we have a legislature with uh, unlimited legal powers is maybe quite surprising. And I think that people from other legal systems where there are constitutions that tell the legislature what it can do, what it can't do, that allow courts to impose limits on what can be done, uh, this idea would seem very uh, surprising. Um, so there are lots of um, difficult questions that arise in relation to sovereignty, but ultimately it's about this idea that there are no legal limits to, to what Parliament can do. And that has all kinds of implications for how we think about the Constitution and how it works. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you to our second panellist, Professor uh, Meg Russell. Uh, Meg is Professor of British and Comparative Politics at University College London. She's also Director of the Constitution Unit. So if you haven't come across their website, please go there. It's got some fantastic um, issues and information, particularly looking at the role of opposition, parliamentary influence, and also the role of the House of Lords. And she's also a Fellow of British Academy. So Meg, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for doing my plugs for me. You can save me time. <laughs> so, um, and thank you for inviting me to speak. So the question is, who's in charge of the Westminster Parliament? I think the implied question is, is it government or does Parliament actually have an independent voice? Um, and my position is that under normal circumstances, when the government has a majority in the House of Commons, it's actually too simplistic to assume that government controls Parliament, um, which many people do assume. There are some very specific privileges that rest with the government, and I would say arguably shouldn't. But when it comes to policy, my two word answer to the question who's in charge of the Westminster Parliament, which would also be simplistic, but my two word answer would be government backbenchers. Uh, and that's not the same thing as government. Um, we have to remember that Westminster is a very complicated place. Parliament isn't a unitary actor. It contains various groups um, who often vote as blocks, but those groups also contain individuals who are capable often of making up their own minds. So as Anthony King wrote years ago uh, in a classic paper, um, Anthony King, the political scientist, that the key block in the Westminster Parliament is government backbenchers because they are the ones who usually provide the government's majority. Without them, the government can't govern. 
So you can only assume that the government totally controls the House of Commons if you assume that government backbenchers are just a group of nodding dogs who'll do whatever the government tells them. And if you ever come across people like Steve Baker or like Jacob Rees-Mogg and Dominic Grieve in the 2017 Parliament, it's actually quite hard to sustain that assumption. So even if there isn't very much conflict on the floor of the House of Commons, and there is sometimes conflict, there are always behind the scenes conversations going on between the government and its backbenchers about what they're prepared to bear. And we saw this in The Guardian today. There was a story about whether Boris Johnson will be able to deliver on his green agenda because his backbenchers may not let him. Um, of course, there are other people who get listened to as well of the opposition, parliamentary committees. I emphasize in my talk that parliaments are a very public place. Uh, where people listen to evidence and the government is held to account for its actions, that all matters too. Um, backbenchers typically at Westminster are a pretty independent lot, particularly compared to other parliaments. The government doesn't have the power over them that it does in many other parliaments, like being able to deny speaking time or parliamentary allowances that applies in some parliaments. But I do also say it's not all a rosy picture. Um, I suggest that Boris Johnson has moved the goalposts in particular, his ejection of those 21 MPs in September 2019 for voting against the whip was a really extraordinary action. Uh, they weren't able to stand uh, in the 2019 general election. So removing his adversaries and also showing what the leader can do if you fall out with the leader has given him significantly more control over his party than is perhaps normal. He's also not afraid of dangling the threat of packing the House of Lords, which is another problematic power uh, that the government has over Parliament. Um, and of course, David may speak about this more. David and I go back a long way on this issue. Um, the government controls the, the agenda of the House of Commons to an unhealthy degree. We've seen that over COVID, denying MPs the ability to debate key policy changes. And we saw it over Brexit, where it was a really big problem. I think that generally the Brexit period has done quite a lot of damage. There was a minority government seeking to use all the powers at its disposal to control a parliament where backbenchers were very opposed to the government. Um, and there were all sorts of sharp practices used that aren't usually used. And I fear that that set a bit of a precedent now and left us a rather unhealthy legacy. Um, and we've got a prime minister who doesn't want to accept norms, he doesn't want to accept constraints, and his parliamentary party is quite pliant. And that's not a good situation. Thank you. And finally, our last member of the panel is David Howarth. Professor David Howarth is the Professor of Law and Public Policy here at Cambridge. He's also head of the Department of Land Economy and a fellow of Clare College. And he also was the MP for Cambridge between 2005 and 2010. So he can give us both a view of what it was like to be an MP, as well as what's, what it is like to analyze what's going on from an academic perspective. So David, over to you. So um, what I'm interested in is sort of between what Meg's interested in and what, what uh, Mark's interested in. So I'm interested in the way Parliament works, but also in the way that translates into the rules by which Parliament who gets to decide the rules, what the rules mean, and how that fits into the broader constitutional context and what sort of democracy we have, um, which you can see coming out of uh, those, those rules. So, for example, um, um, Meg was talking about the control of the, the government, the control the government has over the agenda of the House of Commons. And as you said, we, we, we go back a long way on this issue, back to something called the Right Committee uh, on the Reform of the House. Um, and the, the key rule there is Standing Order 14. Standing Order 14 is a long and interesting history, which I'm really interested in history as well. Um, but what it basically says is the government um, uh, controls what the House talks about. And then it provides for various exceptions, but even the exceptions are very difficult in many uh, cases to... Uh, to be used by the opposition, except when the government thinks they should be allowed to use it. So uh, what I'm interested in is, is, is that sort of rule and how it can be changed and how, we, how the changes in rules and the interpretation of rules uh, can affect how the democracy works. Um, so, for example, um, during the Brexit crisis, the Speaker made a number of rulings that 
fundamentally change the balance of power between the commons and the government. Um, so it's not just that, but, but also, um, and this relates to uh, questions such as, what kind of people um, um, are MPs supposed to be? That is, what kind of job are they supposed to be doing? Um, do they, what, are they there as legislators, which is um, uh, how they're sometimes seen in legal textbooks and, and how they seem to people in other countries? Um, are they there as um, a support mob for, 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 for two competing gangs? Um, and different views on that. And then how that relates to um, some rather fundamental uh, mechanisms about uh, what actually happens when, for example, governments change. So um, um, fundamental question, who chooses the prime minister? You know, who really chooses the prime minister? And so there's a political answer that has to do with the electorate and MPs getting elected, but then what happens if there's no one with a majority? And the technical answer is the Queen gets to choose the Prime Minister. But that can't be the reality. So, what, so what's really going on? And then what happens, for example, when a Prime Minister uh, resigns halfway through a Parliament or the Prime Minister dies? How do we get to choose a new Prime Minister? Who actually does that? And how does it uh, work? So that's the kind of, kind of uh, question I'm interested in, um, that, that how the mechanisms uh, relate to the, these more fundamental questions about what kind of Thank you. So we've had two very interesting viewpoints focusing on a particular legal conclusion. So as far as the law is concerned, we have parliamentary sovereignty. So whoever's in control of parliament effectively has a huge amount of control because of the sovereignty of the laws that they make. But when it comes to working out who is in charge, we've got to think about how this actually operates in practice. And we also need to think about the rules operating in the background to be able to get a full picture. So in order to tease these issues out a little bit further, I have some questions from the panelists. And don't worry, they, they know these are coming. So hopefully this will all go swimmingly and nothing will turn into a total disaster. Um, so the first, I had some questions for Mark, then for Meg and then for David, and then hopefully they'll have a chance to interact with each other before I put further questions from the audience. So Mark, first, in your talk, you mentioned parliamentary sovereignty, but you also mentioned two ways in which parliament can be sovereign. So this idea of continuing and self-embracing. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to watch your video, could you just explain a little bit more about what that means? Sure. So I think it's really a way of trying to think our way through um, a question that always gives me a headache whenever I try to think about it, which is, if Parliament is sovereign and can, can do anything, does that mean that Parliament can make itself not sovereign? So can Parliament limit its own powers and stop it itself from, from doing things or require itself to do certain things in particular ways? So and a, a practical example of this would be that if Parliament wanted to enact a piece of legislation, if we just put the Human Rights Act to one side for a second, um, if Parliament wanted to pass a piece of legislation um, that protected fundamental rights, a kind of Bill of Rights uh, type thing, um, and if it wanted to make it difficult for future parliaments to repeal that, so that it wasn't able to repeal it sort of easily or accidentally or casually, could Parliament write in special procedures or special requirements like a bigger than usual majority? or a special form of word. So can it actually impose these kinds of restrictions on itself? Um, if we take what's called the continuing view of sovereignty, we would say, well, no, Parliament can't do any of those things because the one thing that it can't change is its own power. And Parliament at any point in time has got to be as sovereign as Parliament at any other point in time. The competing view, the self-embracing view would say this, um, yes, it is possible for Parliament to place these sorts of limits um, on itself. Um, in the case law, when courts have looked at these kinds of questions, the answers we get are quite ambiguous. There are some indications in the cases that the courts might recognise these kinds of limitations of Parliament putting restrictions on itself. Uh, but how that would work exactly isn't, isn't very clear from the cases that we've, we've got. But it really goes to this fundamental question of who's in charge and to what extent is Parliament in charge of itself? To what extent can it actually sort of impose these rules on itself and on its successors? Thank you. And that, that 
makes you kind of wonder why is it lawyers, so like you and I are both constitutional lawyers, why are we so concerned about these legal limits? What, why should we think about the legal limits on Parliament's powers, but perhaps not so much about other potential limits on its powers? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose um, really we ought to think about these things in, in the round. Um, if we think about you know, how we would want the constitution to work, how a good constitution might work. What we really want is a system that um, encourages those who have their hands on the levers of power to make sensible decisions, decisions that take into account a range of different uh, points of view, and that really sort of avoids um, the kind of problems that we might get if there is um, an over-concentration of, of power. So I suppose um, in, in the kind of system that we have, we do have to think quite a lot about the political uh, environment, because if, if there aren't really any legal limits on the powers of Parliament, that does place a lot more emphasis on what's going on in the political world. Um, you know, it, 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 we, we, we often sort of criticise things that happen in, in politics and Parliament, and, and there's certainly scope to do that, but the UK, in, in general is not a tyrannical country. We do have basic freedoms um, and egregious laws are generally not passed in this country. And so we have to sort of stop and think, well, why is that? If parliament can do anything, why doesn't it do uh, extreme things like that? And of course the answer is this, that the political culture and the sort of conditioning and the constraints that come from that serve to prevent that from, uh, from happening. But I think that ultimately we are still interested in what the, the legal limit, if any, uh, might be, because that sort of helps us to think about, well, what would happen in a worst case scenario if something did go wrong, if a particular government or a particular parliament did try, for example, to enact um, extreme legislation, um, what would what would then happen? Would the courts have any opportunity to step in? Or would anything like that just be answered by this idea of sovereignty and the idea that once you get a majority behind a bill, um, absolutely anything can be can be done? So I think we worry about it because lawyers like to think about you know what what could happen uh, as well as what is likely to happen, um, and I think it does affect how we think about those sort of worst case scenarios. Thank you. you. You mentioned earlier possibility of perhaps legislation to protect human rights. And we do have such legislation. We have the Human Rights Act 1998, but that operates differently. So do you think this does limit parliamentary sovereignty or do you think it doesn't place any limits on the sovereignty of parliament? Well, I don't think it does, but the Supreme Court does, as we discovered um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so just for the benefit of those who are not familiar with how the Human Rights Act works, very briefly, um, the Human Rights Act gives effect in British law and UK law to the European Convention on Human Rights, which is an international uh, agreement um, whereby um, an, a number of countries have agreed to guarantee certain minimum rights standards. Um, now, the way that the Human Rights Act works is through um, a number of key provisions, including sections three and four. So section three says that um, if courts are interpreting legislation, then where they possibly can, they've got to interpret it consistently with the rights set down in the European Convention on Human Rights. This doesn't allow the courts to ignore what legislation says or to completely change what it says. But it does mean that where the uh, wording allows, they can give it an interpretation that means it's consistent with the uh, European Convention. If they can't do that, then section four of the Human Rights Act comes into play. And this allows a court to issue what we call a declaration of incompatibility, which is the court basically saying, we can't do anything about this. We can't strike the law down because parliament is still sovereign, but we are saying there's a problem here because the law that parliament has made actually conflicts with the rights that the UK has agreed to abide by in the European Convention. Now, the, the conventional view of all of this is that this was a very clever way that the drafters of the Human Rights Act came up with of actually giving quite a high degree of protection to human rights and giving the courts very significant powers to protect human rights, but without going so far as to do something that would call into question parliamentary sovereignty. 
Um, and that's that's certainly my sort of understanding of how this works. That the qualification that I now feel I have to add is that in a in a case that the Supreme Court decided two weeks ago, um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child Bill case, um, the Supreme Court said that Section Three of the Human Rights Act allows courts to modify legislation, and the court said this has the effect of qualifying Parliament's legislative power. And they went even further and said that because section four, when the court issues a declaration under section four, because this puts political pressure on parliament to change the law and to bring it into line with the European Convention on Human Rights, the Supreme Court said that this actually um, affects or interferes with the sovereignty of, of parliament. Now, that doesn't seem correct to me. I think that that is a political matter as opposed to a legal limitation on parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, but certainly uh, in this case, the Supreme Court did think that there were some issues of sovereignty in relation to the Human Rights Act. My final question, we know parliament is sovereign, but should it be if we also say at the same time, sometimes government can just force through any law that it wants? Well, that, that's a very big question. Um, I mean, I, I think it really comes back to the, to the, to the question of how do we manage uh, risks and how do we manage this risk of um, an over-concentration of power uh, leading to the kinds of laws that would really um, concern us. Um, and I'm talking here about, you know, laws that perhaps take away people's basic rights, that, that, that start to dismantle key aspects of the constitution, whether that's democracy, or the independence of the judiciary, um, or whatever that might be. And of course, we might think, well, those things are unthinkable. But of course, we can look at different countries around the world right now, or we can look into the not too distant past, and we can see that these things actually can happen, and they, they have happened. So um, I think that we have to take a view about whether in combination, all of the different safeguards that we have in place are sufficient. And we need to think about the extent to which the courts need to be part of that uh, system. And that would be where things like the Human Rights Act come in and the court's powers to interpret legislation in line with um, fundamental constitutional principles would come in. And we also need to think about how the political institutions themselves work. So are there sufficient balances and checks within government and parliament that mean that we can be sort of relaxed about this theoretical possibility of parliament doing anything that it, that it wants. So we might think about the way in which the House of Lords can act as a kind of counterbalance to the House of Commons and the extent to which parliament itself can act as a check on a government that might want to push through um, this kind of, of legislation. So I think it's a difficult question to give a a sort of a, a, a simple um, answer to, but I think that when we think about that kind of question, we need to be thinking about the overall picture and whether the, the, the set of checks and balances that we have in place overall, are they sufficient to guard against these kinds of risks? Thank you. So we've heard from the legal perspective, but what about from the perspective of those who look at what's going on in parliament? So I'm going to ask some questions of Meg now to build on the video that she prepared for us. And Meg, in your video, you talk a lot about this idea of anticipated reactions and the power of exposure and how that can limit the extent to which the government can get their own way. How do they work? Um, yeah, good question. Um, they're two different mechanisms and they work together to some extent, but they are separate. I think that um, I'm, I'm struck by some of the things that Mark was just saying about constraints. And um, I think there's, a, there's something similar going on here whereby we have, to, we have to think that there are, the legal, legal constraints are not the only constraints. Hard rules are not the only constraints. Culture is very important. Norms of acceptable behavior and so on are very important. And it would be quite interesting to get into some of those scenarios that Mark is talking about. You know, what if what if Parliament decided to abolish elections? Would the judges step in? Well, that's a good question. Would the judges step in? But I think actually the people would step in, the media would step in. So there are all these soft constraints as well as the hard constraints. And I think that applies in, in Parliament as well. Um, 
So Parliament, as I mentioned in the opening remarks, is a very public place. The government is subject to questioning all the time, you know, parliamentary questions in select committees, when it's taking legislation through, when it's presenting statements. And it will always think, um, is, are we going to be embarrassed if we announce this policy? Have we thought it through? Who's going to ask us which question? Do we have the right answers? Are we going to fall on our faces here? Are we going to be on the front page of the newspapers for not knowing what we're talking about, etc.? And it thinks that particularly, obviously, with respect to its own backbenchers, because they hold that key between having a majority and not. So there's an awful lot of work, actually, which goes on inside government to prepare for parliamentary appearances. Um, so, you know, if a minister is appearing in front of a select committee, they will rehearse the questions. They'll think about what the possible questions are, what the possible answers are. They might even have a rehearsal session. They get endless briefing from civil servants for when they stand up at the dispatch box, box at question time, who might ask what. And certainly it happens on legislation. And part of their calculation will be, if I don't have the correct answer for this, I better go and find one. We might have to change our policy because I cannot, if I have to say this, then you know they're gonna, uh, they're gonna throw everything at me and say how unacceptable this is. So you hear stories about policy being changed um, in advance of parliamentary exposure. And you also, um, you also particularly know that this goes on in the legislative process. So they actually have written handling strategies where they try and anticipate which amendments are going to be moved by who, how they're going to respond to them. And if there are parliamentarians who have strong arguments against the government's policy, the government will often change its policy either before it's introduced or through an amendment of its own in order to avoid having that row. So in a sense, it's, they, they work together. They anticipate what they're going to be asked in a public arena they don't want to be embarrassed in that public arena and they need to hold their majority together. So there's a lot of anticipation going on. Sorry, rather long answer. Hope it's clear. <laughs> Thank you. It, was, it is a challenging question. Um, mm. But one thing it, it kind of since the kind of consequence of that seems to be you're suggesting that this idea of executive dominance is just a myth. Is that right? Well, I think it, there is a degree of myth um, involved. I mean, I think it's very easy to assume that because the government doesn't get defeated in the House of Commons very often. The government is getting its way. But if actually what's going on is that the government is thinking about how the House of Commons is going to respond, which actually, you know, it's a pretty rational way to behave. Um, and there are classic um, accounts of how political power works, which emphasizes that it's not just, you know, one side beating the other. If you go into a negotiation, you're already thinking, what are they going to want? And you don't ask for the things that you're not going to be able to get. That's just pointless. Um, so if people see government proposing things to parliament and parliament accepting those things, it's easy to assume that parliament's just sort of spineless and you know not interested in standing up to government. It might actually be that government's had endless discussions behind the scenes, has worked out that some of the things it originally wanted, there's no point asking for because it's not going to get them. And it presents something to parliament, which is what parliament will accept. And it's the funny thing is, it's impossible to tell from the outside which one of those it is. Is, the, is everything gliding through Parliament very easily because Parliament is spineless and won't stand up to government or actually because government has given in and is presenting exactly what Parliament wants? It's, it's kind of a conundrum. So it might, might never be easy to work out what's going on, but we know there's some controls going on in the background. But what about those rules? So you, you and David were talking earlier about reforming perhaps some of the rules that work. And we mentioned standing order number 14, which gives the government the ability to choose the business of the day or prioritize government's business. Is, is this giving too much power to the government? I think it is. Um, and I think we saw particularly that it's very ill suited to the circumstances of minority government. I mean, the, 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 David and I know each other because he was, when he was an MP, he was a member of this committee, the right committee, and I was the specialist advisor to that committee. Um, and we looked at this question of government control of the agenda and devised a mechanism which has improved things slightly to allow backbenchers to decide the topics of debates uh, for a bit more of the time than they previously could do. Um, and that was in light of majority government. So, you know, even when you have a government that has a majority in the House of Commons, you cannot always assume 
that there isn't a majority for something else sometimes. You know, the, the government has written into Standing Order 14, number 14, is that the government can decide what gets discussed. And there's a kind of an unwritten assumption there that the government majority wants that, that this is, this, this is fine because the government's got a majority in parliament. So if the government says something should happen, then that's, what, that's gonna be what parliament wants. But actually sometimes there will be other majorities. Sometimes there will be cross party majorities that would like to talk about something and that's healthy. And, and we wanted to facilitate that happening. This became really problematic in minority government uh, because if you if you believe in Parliament as a as a democratic institution, you know a, a gathering of six hundred and fifty representatives who all have equal rights, then why should a government that controls only a minority of the vote be able to set the agenda? And that's one of the reasons why things got so nasty over Brexit, because Theresa May, who couldn't even control her own party, but her party was short of, I mean, she catastrophically was defeated on Brexit. Um, I can't remember whether she won a majority or a minority of her own party, but it, it was sort of not much more than half for sure. Um, but she could control what got discussed. And when the Brexit deal was originally proposed to be debated, as soon as she was aware that it, nice example of anticipated reactions in a way, as soon as it became clear that she was going to be defeated on it, she simply stopped the debate. She didn't allow the, the, the vote to happen. And this caused enormous frustration on all sides of the House. And then it didn't come back in front of the House of Commons for a whole month. Now, I think that's wrong. I think if, you know, if Parliament is a, represent, is, is a representative body of the people and a majority of MPs want something discussed, they should be able to take that decision. And under times of my majority government, most of the time that will be the same decision that the government would have taken and everything will run pretty smoothly. But in minority government, it, it's really problematic. And many, many legislatures actually have other mechanisms for deciding what the agenda should be. They have cross party committees which decide what the agenda should be. And if we'd had that in Bre under Brexit during the minority government time, I think we could have resolved some of the differences a bit more easily. It was never going to be easy, but a bit, a bit less painfully than it, what happened. Thank you. Well, uh, in terms of anticipated reactions, Meg has fantastically anticipated my next question for and answered it superbly. So if she doesn't mind, I'm going to move on to uh, David now. Um, so um, David, uh, you've mentioned in earlier work, a distinction between Westminster and Whitehall visions of democracy. What does that mean? Uh, um, yes, these are, these are two views of the way our democracy works, and in the way Meg's already referred to them in what she said. Um, on one view, um, the Parliament, and in particular the House of Commons, is the central institution in the whole system. And there's um, MPs as representatives in that uh, institution um, are the centre of all politics. Um, that um, everything else re revolves around the Commons and what the Commons thinks and does. And those debates that happen in the Commons really matter. And MPs, although elected using party labels and logos, are not delegates, they're not fixed in what they have to do. They're representatives who are not just allowed, but actually required to use their own judgment about which way to vote and they can take party interest into account, but they can take into account to the extent that they think is right. So that's, that's the, the Westminster view, and lots follows from the Westminster view about who should be in control of the agenda and how government should be formed. Right? That, that, that's the, the crucial thing about this. Then on the other side, there's the Whitehall view of, uh, Whitehall where the government is, the Whitehall view of the way the system works, where the central institution in the system is the government and its ministers. And um, um, ministers are the most important institution because they exercise monarchical power. This is the history, a, a different version of history uh, from the Westminster. Um, and um, the, the, the Whitehall view moves on from that history to, to being a democratic theory by saying, well, what's a general election about? A general election is about choosing a government and choosing between competing uh, candidates for prime minister. And the electorate speaks and says who the government should be. And then when that happens, the main job of an MP is to, of the governing party, 
is to support the government when the government is putting through the House of Commons uh, the, 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 the program on which that MP and all the other MPs in that party were elected. So the manifesto is the, the key to the, to the Whitehall here. And, and Parliament, and the Commons in particular, on the, on the, so on the Westminster view, Parliament really matters in these debates are about the substance of, of politics. Whereas in the, in the Whitehall view, they are, that, 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 that doesn't matter what Parliament and the Commons in particular is about, is a gladiatorial uh, contest. Uh, in which MPs are there to support their gladiators. Um, and so uh, it's, it's the difference between um, the Commons on a Monday, which is Westminster, and the Commons on a Wednesday, which is Whitehall. So you've also worked as an MP. Did you feel that you were able to make meaningful contributions and amend legislation in your time in the House of Commons? Yes, on, on occasion. The, 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 Going back to what Meg said, um, the crucial people in this, um, in a majority government, but also in a minority uh, government where you need to get a, 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 a clear victory, are the government backbenchers. And so where the opposition can join together with sufficient government backbenchers and avoid having cross rebellion the other way, which is one of the big problems in the Brexit debate, um, when you can get that together, you can. Um, um, defeat the government. And as Meg says, you don't have to do this very often. Now, you just have to do it now and then to remind them that it can happen. So in my time, we, we for example, defeated the Blair government on the 90-day detention matter. And, um, th and that, that, that acts, acts as a, a kind of disciplinary reminder uh, to the government that they have to pay attention to their backbencher. So that, that the, the process that, that, that Meg describes um, it's a very important process of this interaction between the government and its backbenchers um, and the government paying attention in advance to what the backbenchers might say. Uh, that, that does work, but it only works if, if the government is, is reminded about their political moves. So, so yes, um, 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 quite often. And then there are, there, there are occasions where um, you don't start off with any support on, on the um, government backbenchers, you might get a quiz. But you think, well, we'll get some support in the House of Lords. So there's also anticipated defeat in the House of Lords. And the idea that by the time the bill comes back to the Commons, uh, enough uh, support will have gathered among government backbenchers. The government will think, well, maybe we can't win when it comes back. So, so, so you've got like a longer term uh, way of defeating government. And um, um, I, I think we managed to do that in, in, in a bill called the Legislative and Regulatory Reform Bill. Uh, where a very oddly drafted bill kind of gave the government the power to abolish parliament with a sing single vote in the, kind of, in the Lords. Um, and um, I mean, the, 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 that was a campaign that, that, that started just with a few of us on the opposition side. And then it was, what, what actually happened was a media campaign that started. In fact, the, the, um, uh, the sketch writers turned up at the committee, the committee stage of the bill of the Commons, and just made fun of the minister. He was a nice man called Jim Murphy. Uh, but they just kept going and going and going until the government thought this is getting, this is getting beyond a joke. And support was starting to grow in the Lords and support was, there's, there's some murmuring from the government back benches. And so eventually the government, when the bill got to the Lords, proposed amendments. And of course, you know, this looks like the government being very generous and at some point saying, oh yes, we've, we were going to do this all along, um, but they, they weren't. So, so yes, you can, you can have effects um, that way. But often the, the way to have an effect is, is by not claiming the credit for things. So when, you, when you've got a plot for, as a, as a friend of mine in Parliament, um, the MP for Oxford, had this long-term plot to get rid of the crimes of blasphemy and uh, criminal libel, and seditious libel. And, had this, and the plan basically uh, uh, operates on getting government backbenchers to propose his amendments until the, until the government gave in. And of course, it's also a way of getting over the tribalism problem. If, if, if you can get a, a government backbencher to propose an amendment, the, the government whips don't have the tribalist argument to the same extent. They're not saying, they're able to say, oh, well, you're just voting with them. So yes, you, you can get things done, but you have to be, I mean, not, it doesn't always work, in fact, rarely works, and it does in the end. 
I have one final question very, very briefly, because I'm very conscious of time and I do want to put some questions, some great questions coming in from the audience. Um, so you mentioned you like history as well. So very briefly, why is the 3rd of September 2019 so important to you, David? <laughs> <laughs> because, well, well, Meg was talking about this process of, of the government controlling the agenda of the Commons. And um, uh, what happened on the 3rd of September 2019 was a reinterpretation of the rules so radical that it kind of undermined the whole of the previous system. So one of the things I'm interested in is the speaker's ability to reinterpret what the rules say. And there are lots of examples of this during that, that time where uh, Speaker Burko um, 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 reinterpreted the rules in, in, in unexpected ways. But what he did on the 4th, uh, what he did in, in, on, on the uh, 3rd of September 2019 was to radically reinterpret what you could debate understanding order number 24. That is under an emergency debate. It was previously thought that you could only uh, debate under the, that, 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 that standing order, which can be invoked by 40 members of parliament, only the majority. Um, very bland motion saying that the, the House has considered something. Uh, but suddenly it became possible to, to, to consider using that standing order a motion that said the House has considered something and therefore orders the following radical things to, 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 uh, to change, including on that occasion, suspending standing order number 14 completely for the purpose of getting through a bill that uh, had a majority that the government wanted to block. So that's an incredibly radical reinterpretation and um, uh, undermines, um, uh, at least to the extent that um, it might be repeated on future occasions, uh, the former system of government control of the agenda. This was incidentally the same day that Boris Johnson threw out the 21 MPs who voted against his government in that vote. That's right, he threw them out. So he clearly them. thought it was very radical. Uh, yeah, right. you, you talk it up, David, in a way that might sound like Boris Johnson was justified in what he did, which I don't believe he was, not least well, because uh, we've got into this pickle because people like him had voted against Theresa May's Brexit deal and then he had the audacity to throw other people out for voting against his government just once. But. Well, well he, he threw them out because he'd lost control of the House. My, my, my complaint about him is that he should have resigned because he plainly lost the confidence of the House because he couldn't control the, uh, the agenda anymore. And so that was, the, that was the big problem. That led to even more problems later on. Thank you for discussing that. What I'm going to do is put some questions to you from uh, which we've had coming in from the audience through the Q&A and through chat. So one question, which is probably best put to uh, Meg and maybe David, is um, if the government backbenchers have the power, have so much power, who appoints them? So how do you work out whether a particular political party decides whether you can stand for an MP in a certain area, for example? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I would just slip in, I saw that, and I thought, good question, but additional question, who appoints members of the House of Lords? The Prime Minister unregulated appointment power, control over parliament of an inappropriate kind, in my view, for the government, which is not to say, let's have an elected House of Lords, that's a different conversation, but I think if there's gonna be an appointment power, it needs to be regulated. Um, who decides the House of Commons? Well, actually the prime minister has significantly less power over who sits in the House of Commons than he does over who sits in the House of Lords. Um, we have a fairly decentralized system of parliament, of, of candidate selection in the UK, which is a healthy thing, and I think it, it contributes to the independent mindedness of MPs. There is some ability in both of the main parties for the central party to veto, but it tends not to use that power very much. But as I've said, Boris Johnson is kind of, you know, tearing up the rule book. So, um, and he did insist that people standing um, in the 2019 election had to be prepared to go for a no deal Brexit, I think, or some such. Um, so there is a degree of central control, but it's quite loose compared to what it is in a lot of other countries, which is, which is a healthy thing, in my view. I suppose the thing to add is it's one of the, it's, I think, a largely accidental result of uh, the uh, reforms to uh, the way political parties are regulated in, in, in the early 2000s. The party leaders now have the power to withdraw the ability of a parliamentary candidate to use the party name and party logo on the ballot paper. And that indirectly gives, gives party leaders the power to veto candidates. Um, it, it, um, and it's a power, I think, that, 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 that you know, 
in the, the Howard flight example in 2005, of in, in effect, that, that, that was what was, what was done there. And it does mean that party leaders do have a more direct say in who stands, um, rather in the, in the way of a veto, rather than a direct choice. But, 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 but there is more power than there used to be. So I guess another theme that's coming through the questions in the chat is not just this idea of what happens in the Commons, but what about the House of Lords? You mentioned that in some of your discussions. Do we think they can be an effective constraint and should they be an effective constraint? So I guess it's over to David and Meg again. Don't, don't worry, Mark, I'll find a question yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me say something that I was going to say in response to what David said, which I think he gave a really interesting example there of the... Um, uh, the thing that got called the death of Parliament Bill, whose name I won't remember. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the Lords does play a very important role in this, and I think he illustrated with that story very nicely how Westminster is just this really complex interconnected system. There's far more connection between parties, across parties in the Commons, than most people would assume, um, between the backbenchers and the, and, and the government, but also between the chambers. And one of the things that the House of Lords can do is exercise quite an important agenda setting power in the House of Commons. So the government has quite a significant control, as, as we've said, of the House of Commons agenda. It can stop things getting onto the agenda, but what it can't do is control what the House of Lords throws to the House of Commons for decision. And quite often, ministers will be able to sort of quieten down rebellion and discourage unhelpful um, amendments in the Commons. But then the House of Lords will inflict a defeat on the government. And then that comes back to the House of Commons for decision. It's something the government didn't want to discuss. And often backbenchers didn't really want to discuss either because it's an awkward thing where they don't really agree with the government. The House of Lords sticks it there in the middle of their agenda and they suddenly have to decide whether to back the government or not. So that's one of its really quite interesting powers, I think. And I've studied defeats in the House of Lords and my research has shown, although I think maybe things are changing again under Johnson, that about half the times the government is defeated in the Lords, it actually accepts the Lords' proposals. And that is partly because the Lords is defeating the government on things that it wouldn't be able to get past its backbenchers. Yeah. Because they're talking to each other in the way that David described. There's all these back channels all the time. Uh, you know, how can we how can we kind of manipulate the government to get it to accept this? And the Lords plays a very important role in that, and also in all sorts of detailed amendments as well, which the government just accepts because they're quite sensible often. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't want to get into the House of Lords reform, which is the, the, the big issue that lies behind this, about um, what kind of House of Lords um, we, should, we should have, and whether we should have this rather bizarre appointed chamber. Um, and the, the problem with the, with the present setup is that it's deliberately designed so that the House of Lords lacks legitimacy. So that because it's not democratic and it knows it's not democratic and so it does it, it, it can go so far but doesn't go as far as it might want to and often gives way in these, in these ping pong relationships between the two houses um, and, and so the question for, 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 for people who want to reform the House of Lords is do you want a more legitimate House of Lords or do you are you satisfied with this not very legitimate is, is that, that that very complex relationship as it works now um, as much as you want or would you want a, a, a more formal system where democratic legitimacy in the second chamber would mean that it would do this more but 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 even even if it were more democratically uh, legitimate that relationship those subtle interplay the relationships between the two houses would still carry on and and and, and people uh, in in the commons you organize um amendments in the commons with a view to um, uh, what you're going to do in the laws so so not only is the government um, organizing itself uh, in anticipation of what amendments can happen the opposition with the government backbenchers are organizing themselves with a view to what's going to happen later later in the process of that support so we have had some questions on the legal side as well so one question that um we have uh, coming through mark is you talked about this two different types of parliamentary sovereignty. And one question that's come through is, how far do you think the rule of law should play a role in helping us decide which one of these versions of sovereignty we should adhere to? Yeah, so um, I, mean, I think that, that where, where the rule of law fits into all of this is, is a really um, important sort of 
aspect of it because it does go to this 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 very basic question about whether or not parliament really has unlimited powers and are there any sort of restrictions that the courts can apply so i mean as, as meg explained we, we would normally expect long before we got to any question like that we would expect political um sort of constraints and and softer constraints to enter into to play um, but there is this question about, you know, what, what can what could the courts do? What could the rule of law do? Um, I can see another question that's come in, which is on a similar topic about um, is there a body or is there a growing view within the Supreme Court? There's a body of fundamental law that underpins or sits above sovereignty and restricts it um, in some way. Um, and that's a really interesting question, I think, because, again, it, it raises this issue about where does the rule of law fit in? Um, and are there any legal limits to what Parliament can do? And I've been thinking about this a bit recently, actually, in relation to some of the recent cases that the Supreme Court has decided in the last four or five years. And it seems to me that, 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 that there are some quite sort of different things going on. So on the one hand, we have some cases where the court has been very assiduous to reaffirm the sovereignty of, of Parliament. So... For instance, in the, the Miller uh, 1 case about triggering uh, Brexit through Article 50, uh, the court was very clear that European Union law could be reconciled with parliamentary sovereignty. And in effect, the court stood up for Parliament by saying that the government couldn't sort of get around it by triggering Article 50 under the royal prerogative. Similarly, in the Miller 2 case about the prorogation of Parliament, again, the court relies on the idea of parliamentary sovereignty and uses it to kind of um, constrain what the government uh, can do. But on the other hand, we have got cases where the courts have either, um, you might say, taken a very sort of bold or creative approach to interpreting legislation in, in a way that begins to look like they're actually limiting what parliament can do. So there was a case called Evans where the court uh, interpreted uh, an act of parliament uh, in a way that um, two of the judges in the case felt, I think, came close to denying that parliament could do certain things. And we even have cases where the judges have openly questioned uh, what, you know, whether the court would uphold a law if parliament sort of crossed some fundamental constitutional line. So I think that the, these ideas are there in the background. Um, but I think one way that I tend to think about them actually fits in to some extent with what Meg was saying earlier, which is that um, so far these are, are all sort of um, implied or expressed threats about what courts might do if something really bad happened. Um, and I do see that actually as a kind of soft constraint in the sense that the courts are firing a warning shot at Parliament and saying, you know, we we can't guarantee that we'd write you a blank check. And actually, you should think very carefully before you do these uh, quite extreme things. So I think I think in a sense, we can see these partly as, as rule of law issues, but also actually as, as softer constraints that the courts are bringing into the into the dialogue. That's really interesting. Um, it operates the other way as well, doesn't it? People are saying that the courts are anticipating government action against them and therefore are perhaps not challenging the government as much as they would have done because the government is threatening to restrict judicial review. So you can see anticipated reactions in, in play in both directions in that relationship. I think that's right, I agree, yeah. Uh, thank you. I have one final question for all three of you, so I'm conscious of time. So this is the last question, so very, very briefly. How far do you think our question of who controls uh, Westminster is affected by the uncodified nature of the English constitution? I've stumped you all with that one, haven't <laughs> I? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I should start because I know the least about it. Um, I, th I think the answer is that, that, that um, all constitutions are uncodified in the sense that they might start off codified but uh, after being operated for a bit, um, they all get glossed by practice and interpretations of rules and all sorts of, 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 of um, problems arising out of conflicts in, internal to the document. So I suspect that if we were to start again, uh, we might try to solve some of these issues and then they would become unsolved quite, quite quickly. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, there are some fundamental questions that, about how governments are formed, 
um, who gets to decide who the government is, who gets to vote, vote the government in, that we could um, codify, uh, but we never have. And I, I suspect that, that uh, the reason we never have is because it's very convenient for, for se several people in the system that we never get to pin that down. But we could, um, we could improve um, on what we've got. Um, and um, if you look at other constitutions, like the German constitution, for example, uh, those kind of questions are pinned down in their constitution. That's, uh, that, that's really interesting. You mentioned who chooses the prime minister before. And I think if, if, it's, if we had a formal investiture vote, which we don't have here, and uh, many places do, Boris Johnson would not have become prime minister. Absolutely right. This is why uh, this is prime, prime minister might question. have been <laughs> might have been Ken Clark. It might have been Harriet Harman. It might have been Hillary Benn. It certainly wouldn't have been either Jeremy Corbyn or uh, or yeah, Boris Johnson. Uh, <laughs> Margaret Beckett, my better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he might have been prime minister now. Of course, we don't know what would have happened subsequently. But um, in answer to the question, I, let me let me express an aspiration rather than necessarily a description of reality. I suppose. The uncodified nature of the Constitution, the, the lack of judicial control in the Constitution, means that ultimately our last line of defense against tyranny is probably government backbenchers rather than judges. <laughs> um, although, of course, within that soft, that, 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 that environment of softer constraints of public opinion, the media, et cetera, which are enormously important and kind of envelop everything, I hope that that means that government backbenchers are, are aware that they carry that burden and that responsibility and maybe act more responsibly and don't just allow difficult things to get kicked to the judges because if they don't, we're in trouble. We, we defend on them. We depend on them. Well, I'm afraid, Mike, you've got two, two seconds, quickly. <laughs> All I would add is that I think um, Meg puts her finger right on the issue, which is that ultimately you, you've got to have something which is the last line of defence. And I think the question about a written constitution is really about what do we want our last line of defence uh, to be? Thank you. Um, so it just remains for me to thank our excellent panellists for leading such an interesting discussion. So my thanks to Mark, to Meg and to David, uh, to thank the people who operate in the background. So that's Daniel Bates, Dora Robinson and Joanna George who have been working so hard on this project and to make sure it runs so smoothly. Uh, for those of you who asked questions we weren't able to answer, do look on our website and we'll try our best to answer them later on so you can access those answers. And to remind you to go to our website and our next event, we're doing a public lecture on the case that Mark mentioned. Uh, that will take place on the 11th of November. And our next event looking at the role of the judici judiciary will be on the 22nd of November. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>